Welcome to the advisory group's five points for five years before you retire workshop. Let's first start with some introductions. My name is William Glenn and I'm a client services associate as one of the tag team members. Also joining me today are Brent Beverly, the president of the advisory group and Manny Chin Che, a senior advisor at the advisory group. Both of them are certified financial planner practitioners and wealth advisors at our Diamond Bar branch. We have a special treat for you today. We are bringing in a new speaker, Mark Cox, who many of you will recognize as the person who greets you when you first come into our office. At our firm, we partner with clients and believe an educated client is our best client. While we will always try our best to help you when it comes to your finances, we believe that knowledge is power. One of our missions is to share with clients any knowledge that can help them make an informed decision. We believe that the more you know, the more you will like what we do and how we do it. As a reminder, it is always important to review that there are five key areas of financial planning. They are preservation planning, retirement planning, tax planning, estate planning, and investment planning. As a comprehensive financial services firm, we try to always consider the impact of any recommendation we make on not just one, but all of these areas for our clients. In this workshop, we will primarily be focusing on retirement planning, tax planning, and investment planning. Our agenda is very straightforward. As you get close to retirement, it is important to begin lining up what you are going to need. Let's review the five points we will cover in today's meeting. Point one, where will you live and what will you do? How do you dream of spending your days? Will you take time to travel and see the world? Or would you prefer to keep closer to home and pick up a new hobby? However you see your retirement, it's important to make sure your finances can support your overall goals. Have you considered relocating to a state that doesn't require as many taxes? Many retirees consider downsizing to lower expensive or plan to move closer to family to help care for your grandchildren or your loved ones. Overall, there can be many benefits to living closer to family as you age. Point two, consider your debt and taxes. Retiring to a lower income tax bracket is possible. Considering a one-time tax hit, such as selling a home or moving from a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA, could eventually produce a source of tax-free retirement income. But before you make any decisions, consult with a qualified tax professional to see if this move is right for you. Income and age restrictions may apply. Point number three, estimate your monthly income and expenses. How well will you live? Your monthly needs could decline based on a lesser need for extras, but it could also quickly change based on your health or family circumstances. So estimating on the higher side could help. Let's not forget that you will have far more free time once you are retired, which leads to leaving the home, which typically leads to spending of some sort. This is what we like to call the seven day weekend phenomenon, and most of us spend more on the weekends. Included here is what you will be spending. What is your standard of living? Point four, healthcare costs. Will you apply and be eligible for Medicare? And will this cover your present and future needs? It is possible you or a loved one may need long-term care some point during retirement, and this could affect your overall bottom line. If you decide to retire when you are younger than Medicare age and were dependent on your employment to provide or subsidize your health insurance plan, it is crucial to determine what the game plan will be as you bridge that gap to Medicare eligibility. And last and possibly the most important, Point five, how are you going to pay for it all? When that paycheck stops, how sure are you that you are not going to run out of money before you run out of life? Your investing strategy can make all the difference. Planning for retirement involves setting goals and a defined strategy towards those goals. Whatever your plans are, please make sure that you have made all the arrangements beforehand so you can live your retirement as confident as possible. Let's explore these points in more detail. To get into the meat of our presentation, I would like to bring up our next speaker, Mr. Chinje. Manny? Thank you, Will. Let's start on our discussion today. 
where will you live? That's probably the most crucial decision that you make when you retire. This one question largely determines everything else that we're going to review here. Many retirees consider downsizing to lower expenses or plan to move closer to the family to help care for grandchildren or loved ones. Have you considered relocating into a state that doesn't require as many taxes? Overall, there can be many benefits to living closer to family as you age. Making a move may trigger new expenses or incomes. Will you need to sell a property, sell additional stock, or any other investments to purchase a new home or pay for your move? All of these should be considered ahead of time to make the best use of your available funds. Many retirees look to move out of high tax states such as California or New York to move to states with low or even zero state income taxes. Be aware that some of these other states make up for the lower income taxes by having higher sales and higher property taxes. Will those affect you in your new situation? Another area of concern for retirees is not only the cost of health care in their new location, but also its availability. If you purchase a hobby farm, how long of a drive is it to good health care? Larger cities typically have more resources for advanced health care. Some retirees plan to live outside the U.S. and health care resources may be significantly affected. Retirees who have Medicare, especially Medicare Part C, can find themselves with severely limited choices. And we will discuss that further on later in the workshop. We hear from our retiree clients, how did I do all of this and work a full-time job at the same time? Almost all of our clients who have retired feel very busy and very fulfilled. Here's your chance to really think about all the goals and dreams that are important to you. What will make your life fulfilling? What are those things that you have always wanted to do but just did not have the time to do? What trips do you want to take? One-time trips or regular excursions with family or friends or solo? Instead of collecting that paycheck, is there volunteer work that you may want to do? How about your family? Are they going to be nearby or a long distance away? Maybe you want to help with grandkids or other family members, or maybe just spend extra time with your spouse. Just remember, your spouse may not be used to having you, to, to having you around so much, so please be considerate of that. Finally, are there community activities that you may want to join, such as assisting the police or fire departments or social assistance programs such as the Community Emergency Response Team? Sir, there are a lot of things available to do. How do you make sure you're doing the things you want to do? Every retirement can benefit from a little future planning, so take the time now to explore what will make life fulfilling in retirement. You may be surprised to hear that this takes some work and introspection to learn what you truly want. And don't be afraid to ask us for a copy of My Future Planner. Where you decide to live will often be largely dependent on your debt and taxes. If you're selling a house to move to another one, you likely have a low interest rate loan locked in. The new mortgage rate is likely to be higher than your existing mortgage range, so that may have an important impact on your decision to sell your home to buy a new one elsewhere. When that paycheck stops in retirement, having other debt may also affect your ability to enjoy retirement, so be sure to work with your advisors before making any drastic moves. Now we noted that many states have income taxes, ranging from California's top rate of 13.3% down to seven states with zero state income taxes. Other taxes can also affect you, especially depending on where you live. Income taxes, property taxes, sales taxes, uh, vehicle registrations, and other ways the governments reach into your pockets. These offer taxes may be higher than you see where you are now. Investigate in advance so that you don't find any unwelcome surprises. Often at retirement, parents look at gifting to their kids and grandkids. As a result of the SECURE Act, overall family tax bracket management is a critical area for those with untaxed retirement assets to explore each year. One of your choices is always to leave everything the way it currently is. If you're at a higher marginal tax bracket than your beneficiaries, then it may make sense to let them take the distributions after your death in their tax bracket rather than you and yours. 
In this case, doing a Roth conversion does not make sense. However, if your beneficiaries are in a higher marginal tax bracket than you are, then it may make sense to take distributions in your tax bracket while you can and then to convert these accounts to Roth IRAs and leave your beneficiaries an account that, while it still must be taken out within 10 years of your death, can grow tax-free all that time. This method leaves you in control of your assets should you need them for yourself, but provides them tax-free to your heirs should you not need the funds with you having paid the taxes due at your lower tax bracket. An annual step to consider is to review your marginal tax rate and your beneficiary's marginal tax rates each and every year. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time in this session discussing the upcoming expected change in the tax laws, but the timing of the change may affect some of the actions you want to take. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, known as the TCJA, passed in 2017, brought many changes to the tax code. Unless any changes are signed into law, here are a few key tax rules that are set to expire on December 31st, 2025. Some changes that are already scheduled include Individual income tax rates. If no action is taken before 2026, these tax rates will expire at the end of 2025. In 2026, we will go back to the 2017 tax rates based on incomes adjusted for inflation. The tax rates we have today are lower and much wider, meaning that in many cases, more income is taxed at lower rates when compared to 2017. For planning purposes, given the same level of income, most people could find themselves paying more in taxes in 2026 than they did in 2023. The elevated estate tax exclusions. As of now, again, barring any changes in 2026, the estate tax exclusion is due to revert to pre-2018 levels, adjusted for inflation, which we expect will be approximately six to seven million dollars for individuals. This is almost half of the current limit of $12.92 million for individuals and $25.84 million for couples. Currently, there's a 40% maximum gift and estate tax rate. This rate is set to increase in 2026 to 45%. The SALT cap will disappear. The, tax, the TCJA eliminated or limited many of the previous laws concerning itemized deductions. An example is the state and local tax deduction, the SALT, which is currently capped at $10,000 per year or $5,000 for a taxpayer filing separately. This cap is set to dissolve after 2025. The child care tax credit is set to revert to $1,000 from its current level of $2,000 for children under age 17. And finally, the AMT is back. The alternative minimum tax will likely hit taxpayers much harder as it did before 2017. We enjoy keeping clients aware of tax law changes and we will be addressing these expected changes much more as the sunset time draws closer. Now to proceed with our presentation, allow me to bring up Mr. Beverly. Brent? Thank you, Manny. <laughs> That's a lot to cover. So in combination with where you plan to live, you need to check your incomes and expenses. How well are you going to be able to live? Are your resources sufficient to maintain that standard of living throughout your expected lives? Now, in earlier times, many retirees had as their base income a company pension. These days, unless you're a government employee or involved with education, most retirees no longer receive that fixed lifetime guaranteed income. Now, most of us do expect to have income from Social Security. Now, we're not going to cover the decision that comes with making when you take Social Security, especially when to start the income to get the maximum benefit. But let me just take a minute to talk about some of the things that we're seeing in the future of Social Security. Each year for the last half dozen years, the Social Security trustees have delivered an annual report that reminds us that Social Security Trust Fund is rapidly being used up. Now, they calculate that sometime around 2033 to 2035, okay, about 10 years from now, Social Security benefits will need to be reduced by 20 to 25 percent across the board unless changes are made by Congress before then. Now, most of us expect to be drawing Social Security at that point and beyond. Beyond that, 
funds that you've put away are what's left. The first place we usually look for the pension plans that have been funded over the working years are 401ks, our 403bs, or TSAs, IRAs, etc. Don't forget to include your required minimum distributions when you calculate those. And finally, we want to look at your other investments. Now, we're going to discuss strategy to handle the withdrawal process in just a few slides here. But as you approach your retirement, consider readjusting or reallocating your portfolio and evaluating other income producing and growth, in growth investments. As you do that, be sure to keep in mind that your time frame is not the date of your retirement. Your time frame is likely decades after that retirement that you've got to protect for. Now, your incomes need to keep up with your expenses, which are likely going to be rising with inflation over time. Check your different incomes to make sure. Are they flat or even decreasing and losing their spending power to the rising costs you're going to face? Or are they going to be increasing? If they are increasing, are they actually keeping up with your needs? And we're going to discuss this more in just a minute. So one note I want to throw in here, though, is that while Social Security income typically increases each year, our experience has been that it does not increase at the same rate as the expenses paid by retirees. The rate, or CPI, Consumer Price Index, in our experience, runs below the costs faced by retirees. And that calculation does not include the expected reduction of Social Security benefits in about 10 years that we just talked about. Now, Manny talked about where you live, and where you live may have a significant effect on your expenses. A major expense for most of us is our housing costs. Do we have a mortgage or pay rent? If we have our own place, even with the mortgage paid off, well, what about property taxes, homeowners association, property insurance, utilities, maintenance, repairs? I mean, there's a, a lot of costs that go into this. We've already discussed how other taxes can affect you, especially depending on where you live. Income taxes, sales taxes, registrations, and all the other ways that the governments reach into your pockets. Now, even with housing considered, we still need to live. Dining at home, dining out, clothing, transportation, other supplies. As everyone who's paid bills know, this list seems to be endless. Now, a lot of retirees look at their retirement as a chance to visit places they've always wanted to see. Many times the travel budget can be considerable. We find it interesting that many retirees figure their travel budget will be high for a while and then drop off as they age. But many of our senior retirees still love to travel, still do those expenses. And in fact, a lot of times it's higher because they're going with groups rather than just winging it individually. And a final expense we want to note is the medical. Not only medical insurance and Medicare, but also prescriptions, doctor visits, more. We want to note that many retirees will need long-term care. We're going to talk more about that in a little bit. What changes do we see in your spending in retirement? As with incomes, the key question is, what changes? Look at each expense item. Are your expenses flat, such as a fixed mortgage payment? Or are they decreasing, such as maybe child support or going away? Um, when you stop doing things you needed to do before? You know, an example I like to use, we find that dry cleaning bills usually drop substantially when people retire. So the problems that most of your expenses are gonna be rising, all right? Protecting your lifestyle from inflation or price increases is vital. And how can this be done? Inflation is a big concern when you have a long period of time you're dealing with. Which takes me to my next point, which is when we look at your income and expenses, how long is that retirement period gonna be? If you're gonna die tomorrow, go have a wild night because you made it. The truth is that most people are gonna live a lot longer than that and perhaps longer than they expect the retirement time frame starts when you actually retire. Retiring early may also reduce your long-term benefits. We see this most clearly when dealing with Social Security. Starting your income at age 62 gets the income started sooner, but results in a lower income for the rest of your life. The same calculations apply at any age before age 70 when Social Security benefits max out. 
So that takes us to how long will your retirement last? Especially if there's a couple involved. How's your health? Now, if you have stage four cancer, your life expectancy is probably a lot less than someone who's healthy. So think about your family history. Does your family have longevity? Is your 80 year old father still taking care of your 100 year old grandmother? Well, you might plan for a longer retirement than someone whose family all passed away in their 60s and 70s. Now, given what I quote, miracles of modern medicine, things that might have killed someone a few years ago now can be cured and a long life expected. Let's take a look at some statistics on life expectancy. I'm sure many of you are aware that medical advances and healthier lifestyles have increased our longevity. Let's look at the bottom of this graph. A couple who reaches age 65 has a 50% chance of one of them living into their early 90s and a 25% chance of living into their late 90s. So we can assume from these statistics that at least one person from a couple will live into their 90s. Okay. However, many people are not taking longevity into account when taking their benefits. Our real problem is inflation. It is simply that costs tend to go up over time. That's what inflation is. If you watch the old time movies from the 1940s, for example, you may hear them talking about life insurance and you would hear things such as, quote, he's rich. He has a $10,000 life insurance policy, close quote. All right. Nowadays, it's hard to even find a policy as small as $10,000. We have clients who've lived into their homes long enough to pay off their 30 year mortgage. And when we ask them how much they paid for their homes, the figures typically have fewer numbers before the decimal point than their current homes. All right, the OIG, I bought it for 100,000, it's worth a million dollars now. Unbelievable, okay? If you, survive, if you lived in your home for more than 10 years, compare what you bought the home for and what it's worth today. Guys, that's inflation. Now I wanna note, the longer your life expectancy, the greater the effects of inflation will have on your need for income. Even though inflation is now showing time signs of slowing down from last year, we don't know what it might be long-term. When I started practicing in the mid eighties, inflation in the US was double digits. At one point it reached almost 14%. I remember using a 7% inflation rate in our retirement projections and having clients upset with me saying, how could we possibly use such a low rate of inflation on our calculations? 7%? Well, nowadays we use three and three quarters, but you know, guys, we don't know what inflation is going to be over the next 20, 30 years. Further, as we alluded, the CPI used to calculate inflation is often actually lower than the costs we individually face. In 1980, the US Treasury Department changed how they calculate inflation, primarily to include what they call the substitution factor. Now, what does that mean? That means if the price of beef goes up too high, people will start to eat less of the expensive beef and more of say inexpensive chicken. They'll substitute there. And so that lowers the inflation rate. Using the pre-1980 charts and method of calculation, CPI would actually be close to double what the current figures tell us inflation is. What really matters with price increases is what affects you. The cost of real estate rising does not really affect your living standard if you own and stay in your own home, for example. Another thing we worry about is interest rates. Why do we worry about interest rates in retirement? Well, as we noted earlier, if you're selling a house to move to another area, you likely have a low interest rate that you locked in. The new mortgage rate is likely to be much higher than your existing mortgage rate. Also, when interest rates were so low a few years ago, it was really hard for retirees to earn the interest needed from less volatile fixed investments to keep up with their standard of living. Bank account interest rates typically learn mu earn much less than inflation especially after you consider taxes. A typical emotional reaction to retiring and no longer having that steady paycheck coming in is to say, oh, we need to be extra cautious. So I'm gonna put more money into my bank accounts just to be safe. Well, this is what we refer to as going broke safely. You're losing spending power every year over the long term 
while being principal protected in the short run in your bank accounts. So to cover our next point, please allow me to bring Manny back up. Manny? Thank you, Brent. So let's look at some of the additional items that you need to consider when you retire. First, let's take a look at the cost of healthcare. Our session today is not detailed enough to cover all that retirees need to know about healthcare costs, but we want to emphasize that healthcare is an important part of our retirement roadmap. If you retire prior to age 65, you may be covered by COBRA medical insurance from your former employer, or you may want to go get your own coverage in the private market. A lot depends on your medical condition. Once you turn age 65, you will want to elect Medicare and choose between the two alternatives. And we'll cover more of that in the next slide. It is reported that 64% of retirees believe that long-term care expenses are covered by Medicare. This is not true, so we want to give you a little background on what long-term care is all about. How likely is it that you'll need it? What the possible costs are? And get you started on designing your plan on how you can meet these costs. First, let's look at Medicare. As we noted, there are two ways of signing up for Medicare. Original Medicare versus Medicare Advantage. Now, pointing on the left side is the original Medicare, which includes Part A for hospital, Part B for medical, plus Part D for prescriptions, adding on Medigap supplemental insurance. Now, on the right side is the alternative Medicare Advantage route, also known as Medicare Part C. Now, you have this slide with all of these slides in your meeting handout that you received from us before the presentation. We believe it's informative to read the bottom of this page. Note that Part C Medicare Advantage may be different if you move to a new location. As an example, some clients like to work with Kaiser Permanente here in California, but Kaiser is not likely to be available if you move out of state. So make sure you can find the coverage you need wherever it is that you may be going. How many people do you expect will need long-term care one day? It's not surprising that few of us do because it's hard to face the fact that our health may decline. But statistics suggest that the risk is greater than most people think. Approximately 70% of us, that's seven out of every 10 people here today, will need some type of long-term care service during our lifetimes at some point after we reach age 65. And though it's good news that people are living longer, a longer lifespan increases the chance of developing serious health problems. In fact, according to the Alzheimer's Association, approximately 14% of people aged 71 and older have Alzheimer's disease, which often leads to the need for nursing home care. One in three Americans die with Alzheimer's or some other dementia. And while older people are more likely to need long-term care, younger people may need care too, as a result of a disabling accident or illness such as multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's disease. Now, this isn't meant to scare you, but rather to remind you that the need for long-term care can happen to anyone at any time. The need to be prepared is real and something you should not ignore. So what are the costs of care? Now, the cost of care continues to go up. A couple of years ago, according to Consumer Affairs, the median annual cost of a nursing home was between $85,000 and $150,000 per year. At an assisted living facility, the average cost is $51,600 per year, and the average cost for a full-time in-home care is $4,385 per month. This is the national average. So you can imagine that in areas such as Orange and Los Angeles counties, the cost will be on the higher end of the range and far higher than the average. Our experience is that the cost for full-time in-home care in our area is more than three times that number, or over $15,000 per month. Fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, people who are healthy and rich tend to live longer and hence have a greater need for long-term care. If you need long-term care and have more than the government limits in net worth or income, where will you get the funds to pay for your care or that of your parents? Here's where the money comes from. Savings, investment accounts, retirement accounts, pensions, family members may assist, reverse mortgages, and should you have it, insurance coverages. We find that most people, especially those who have not planned for long-term care, start as private payers, paying from their own pockets. 
when they use up all of their resources, they end up turning to the government for financial assistance. The government won't take care of you until you're down to almost nothing in assets. In addition to the costs paid by the care receiver, there are also the costs paid by the caregiver, typically your family, but often others who are taking care of you. A scary statistic is that 83% of caregivers contributed financially to the cost of care. The chart here on your screen is actually a measure of the risks Americans face from incapacity as they age, specifically their risk of debilitating problems like Alzheimer's, other kinds of dementia or MCI, mild cognitive impairment. According to these statistics, currently one in eight people at age 68 will suffer from one of these illnesses. That figure more than doubles by the time they reach 78, and it increases sixfold by the time they are 88. Over the next 10 years, nearly one in three people we now serve is likely to become incapacitated, and a great many more will be affected when someone in their life does. We'll also have to be there for perhaps three generations of family members affected by their aging parents' or grandparents' new reality. Now, when we talk about long-term care, these numbers are staggering. So make sure you have a plan of action ready for you, your parents, and your children. Now, let's change the subject and talk about what happens the day after you stop working and that paycheck stops. How is that income replaced? So allow me to bring Brent back up. Brent. Thank you, Manny. Nice to get back up here. So where will the income come from when your paycheck stops, how are you gonna keep up with rising costs? Now, these are the most common questions we hear as people prepare to go into retirement. Our income is obvious when we have social security, a pension or an annuity that replaces 100% of our income, but usually this is not the case. If there is a shortfall, then we must rely on systematic withdrawals from our investments. And remember, when it comes to long-term investing, there are quite a few concerns to be considered. There is no perfect investment out there. Instead, you need a strategy to increase your chances of navigating your financial future to arrive at your destination safely. Market concerns, especially as you start needing income from your investments, can be much more immediate than they are when you have time to let the markets work themselves out. So what sort of portfolio changes can you make to help ensure an enjoyable retirement? As you can see from this view, these investors who focus on long-term strategy were historically rewarded with significant returns. Note the heading where it says, as of September 27th, 2022. Now, why would we pick that particular date to end this slide? September 27th of 2022 was the low point of the market in 2022 and since then. So what has the market done since then? It's generally gone up. But even at the low point, we like to say those investors who focus on a long-term strategy were re historically rewarded with significant returns. But the concern is when you're withdrawing funds, the effective market downturns can be devastating to your portfolio. Look at all those downturns along the way. So how can you protect yourself? So here's a concept that might help. This is what we call our three bucket approach. The three bucket method of setting up retirement withdrawals helps us visualize how our retirement income will be managed from a liability standpoint. Withdrawals to support our lifestyle is the liability we commit to with our investment portfolios. Now, I'm actually gonna cover these buckets in reverse order, starting with the bottom, the green bucket here, the short-term or intermediate bucket. Now we sometimes refer to this as the spending bucket. This bucket is where you want to be pulling your income from so that you'll have largely cash and cash equivalents and short-term investments that are not subject to market fluctuations of much significance. Now, typically we expect to hold roughly a year of expected withdrawals in this account. When the markets are down, you only take income from your cash reserves bucket, your short-term bucket. As markets recover or look more normal, 
then regular transfers from the next bucket can replace the funds that have been taken. These come from the second bucket, marked here in blue, which is the intermediate bucket. Now, we sometimes refer to this bucket as the second tier bucket. And this bucket's going to focus on investments which are less volatile, oftentimes fixed income and income with growth or equity or protected assets. The time frame on these investments is typically three to five years. The primary goal here is to keep up with inflation while helping to protect the downside. And that takes us to the long term, the red bucket. The investments in this portion are designed for long term growth. Since there are the other buckets to cushion any downturns, the goal on this long term bucket is to grow as much as possible over the period of over five years to provide the resources for inflation protected incomes in the long run. So this three bucket strategy is designed to provide us with a bit of safeguard against normal market fluctuations, normal markets up and up and downs. When the market is down, you rely on the short term bucket to draw the funds you need. Assuming the markets go up over time, as the markets go up, you may draw down from the blue and the red buckets to replenish the spending bucket. You're then able to weather another downturn when that happens down the road, as they seem to always do. Market downturns are normal, but not predictable. So this tool gives your investments a way of handling those downturns. You never want to be in a position where you withdraw from the wrong bucket at an inopportune time. In other words, you don't want to pull from the red bucket when things are way down. Now, we'd like to remind you of these four things that can help you approach your investments with disciplined and focused direction. Your risk tolerance or your appetite for risk. By this, we mean how much risk can you take or better yet, how much can you afford to take? Your time horizon or the amount of time you want to be invested in any situation which can help determine your entry and exit points. Your retirement is likely measured in decades, not just a few years. Your behavior. Market volatility is a part of the investing experience. This can create anxiety and stress when volatility occurs. Do you know how well you can emotionally endure those potential ups and downs of your investments? And then finally, stay focused on your overall strategy. Don't get caught up in emotional investing. <clears throat> Are you looking at something that doesn't quite fit in with your overall strategy? Perhaps the media is influencing you to make a rash or impulsive decision on your investments, an emotional decision. Well, we can help you overcome that short term fear and greed emotions that might distract you from your long term investing approach. We want your holdings to be consistent with your overall strategy. Panic can create more risk and potentially cause setbacks in your goals. We believe that the long term success comes from maintaining your overall strategy. Now that said, past performance is not an indicator of future performance. 2024 has already been a very interesting year and it's not over yet. So we stand by our mantra of proceed with caution. Please remember, we'll be watching all areas of the economy and financial markets, which we feel may affect our clients. If emotional investing triggers and that hits you, we're here for you. We're here for you to help you stay with your long term strategy. So just running through some key points, we hope you take away from this investment for retirement points. Number one, caution is still the principle of notion for investors. Inflation, while slowing down, continues to be a concern. Interest rates are likely to change. Gee, or is that one coming in? All right. Market downturns are likely to occur multiple times in the future. Long term investing is a strategy, a key strategy with equity markets. And we're here to help you. So let me bring up a new speaker for our company, Mr. Cox, to wrap us up. Mark. So thank you, Brent. Hello, everyone. Uh, I just want to say I'm happy to be here today and this is my first client education session. So it might be my first, but it's not my last. So thank you for having me, everyone. Now let's review the key points from today's meeting. 
First, you're going to want to take time to picture what retirement is going to look like for you. Next, remember to understand what debt you'll be carrying into your, your retirement. Next key point is to meet with your tax advisor to understand what your tax picture will be looking like in retirement and what kinds of actions you should take now to prepare for your retirement. Next, a detailed review of your expenses in retirement can provide you with a more accurate target of what to aim for. So understanding what incomes you'll be having and when is quite important. Next, make sure to develop a plan for handling your health care costs in retirement, especially those long-term care costs, which can be quite expensive. And last key point, to review is remember to focus your investment portfolio to provide long-term income which is tax aware and can help protect against inflation and all as always remember that nothing will happen unless you take action this is coming so don't let retirement sneak up on you handle it the other way around and get the jump on it So we've covered a lot today and you may be asking what can you expect from us at the, at the advisory group? Well, one of our main focuses is to review changes for our clients on an ongoing basis. So you can expect regular communication, more frequent discussions, and you can expect that we're always reviewing economic tax, estate, and investment issues for our clients. We then work to summarize what's important that our clients need and then do that in the regular communication bit that I just mentioned. So for example, look for more communications about the 2025 tax sunset. In fact, as we noted earlier, we'll be offering other workshops that highlight tax changes and planning ideas. So be on the lookout for when those come out. So we appreciate your focus and attention during this presentation and we hope you found the information helpful. Of course, there are important disclosures that need to be made, so that is what is on screen at this time. Please give them a look over. Now, if you want to reach out to us, here's our contact information, which we will also post again in a couple of slides. So, We'd just like to say that we are thankful for the opportunity to assist with your financial needs and goals. Remember, at our firm, our clients come first. And so your health and well-being is always our highest priority. So thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions or would like to be added to our distribution lists, such as for our regular newsletter emails, up-to-date information, or anything else, please reach out to us. We are glad to be of service. This concludes our presentation. And thank you again. And as always, we hope you have a wonderful day.